Today, we are joined by Michael Potts, the CEO of Polycount.io and M2 Studio. He's uh, joining us from Dallas, Texas, and he has been building experiences for VR for over 20 years, been working in the metaverse. His current company architects virtual environments for brands that you've heard of and that are in the metaverse, along with a, a lot of other immersive experiences. So really excited to connect with you today. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, having me. So like I said, I connected with you mainly because I am a recent owner of a NFT environment inside of Spatial.io. It's called Isoblock. Tell me what what you guys did for that specifically, because I've seen your logo there and I think you guys were even at the initial event. But why don't you start us off telling us uh, about that experience and, and maybe how you've connected with uh, other brands as it relates to Spatial and the metaverse and things like that. Well, so the ISO block uh, was our second NFT uh, metaverse experience. We collaborated with the artist uh, Trash Hand, who's a very talented artist who takes photographs of abandoned, abandoned buildings. And the collaboration went more than just sort of how are we going to show off your artwork? But, you know, he, he really had some great ideas on, on what he wanted this, this space, this metaverse experience to be. We created it with him, with his ideas. And, and, and my team, including Brian, who's my, my uh, business partner, we really um, met with him a lot throughout the process in the virtual reality environment, showing him how things were developing, getting feedback from both him, some members from Spatial, and, and getting some, you know, some ideas from, from various members of my team. But it's a collaborative process, and it's a lot of fun. And, and then he was, I think, really, the artist was stoked at the ex entire experience. But then the final product was something that, you know, could show off his artwork, and, and it was a space that he it was very much of his brainchild and, you know, he was very involved in the entire experience. And we were just sort of the, uh, sort of the, the, the artists taking the cues from, you know, the, another artist of what he wanted and sculpting and creating the space for him. And we've done that for a number of brands recently. And we're working with other artists currently that are creating environments and experiences based on, uh, you know, their art to create a new type of gallery, a gallery that sort of feels like it belongs, uh, with the art instead of it being just a white box would be instead the gallery is actually uh you know inspired by the art i see got it yeah i think i think uh definitely it stood out to me i think uh also with your first nft drop uh in partnership with spatial kind of saw that and was really really impressed with how that looked um but yeah definitely with the iso block i saw that there was a lot of uh there's a big technical fee to get a file size small enough to kind of work with Spatial's environment and some of their limitations, but also being able to represent the artist's brand and get, I know there's a graffiti artist and, and then it was just a really, you know, massive uh, kind of environment. Um, for those that haven't seen that, definitely check that out. I think it's uh, isoblock.xyz. Um, and I think there's other, you can kind of see that through Spatial. They're, they're kind of promoting that currently. And so uh, your part, you've partnered with others there. I, mean, I it's a really innovative thing. I, I don't know if people understand what's going on here. So these are environments that are actual NFTs, and it essentially uh, allows the owner of the NFT to be able to leverage the environment, in this case that you guys have created, um, to be able to use for their own meetings and galleries and, and things like that. And um, are there any other environments that you guys work with uh, outside of Spatial that are doing this kind of, this kind of thing of uh, kind of NFT environments and things like that? We're working with, um, uh, we work with about 10 different platforms. Spatial is the one we, we use more than a, any others by a factor of about 10 to one. But um, mm. we work with a group called Vatom and they have this platform that allows you to have a large number of attendees. Now the avatars are different and the spaces are different, but it's essentially it's similar. And they do have NFT uh, uh, compatibility. A lot of the other platforms don't though, currently have the ability to have um, an NFT integration. Um, one of the experiences that we like, one of the platforms we like is Altspace, and that's owned by Microsoft. And we've had a number of events in that in that platform. But right now, currently, they, they do not have NFT integration. So, uh, you know, Spatial's ahead in this in this regard, as far as an immersive virtual reality experience that you can experience in virtual reality um, on the web or on a mobile device, and be able to, you know, to have an NFT that's linked to your wallet and you can open up that wallet and go in and mm. have a party with your friends in that space that you just bought. So um, it's an exciting, it's an exciting and new direction. And, you know, we actually have, uh, I would say four or five others ready to go queued up. I think one of them is going on sale on Friday to benefit Ukraine. Um, hundred percent of the proceeds are hundred percent of the work that we were 
we've done is all that the money is going to go to uh, Ukraine. Um, and uh, wow. we've got, uh, yeah, three, four or five others, three or four others that are going to, that are queued up for April, May, June, July. And some of them are in environments that we've created entirely ourselves. And some of them are other ex experiences where we've collaborated with an artist um, or an NFT group. We're working with the eight Asians group right now to create uh, some NFT spaces for them. We've got um, some groups uh, associated with the Tokyo Art Fair that we're creating the NFT experience with for them. And then um, some other photographers and, 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 and artists that we're, we're, we've either built spaces already and we're just waiting for them to sort of drop down the road or we're working in currently with these other artists that, uh, to create experiences for them. Wow, wow, that's impressive. You mentioned that there are uh, about 10 brands or I guess uh, metaverse kind of environments that you work with. You mentioned right. VR or sorry, uh, Altspace. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Um, Altspace, spatial... yeah, I can go through them real quick. Altspace. Yeah. So again, Spatial is the one that we use the most, but we probably number two would be Altspace and then Vatom, uh, Engage. Uh, we're talking, we're working with Glue. We've done some work with um, uh, Arthur, which is a great program. Um, and then uh, we do, we've worked on some sna uh, uh, sandbox. We're working on a project with Jose Cuervo for Decentraland. Um, and what we find, what we find is that the, our process allows us to build an environment that'll usually work on multiple platforms. So we mm -hmm. don't have to change our process too much. Now, some platforms like Decentraland have a th lower threshold for geometry and textures. So we have to sort of like step it back a little bit from what we're doing. But most of these other platforms will have a similar enough um, uh, th sort of like limits of what they're what they can handle. So if we build an experience on one platform, it can it can exist on others. Uh, there mm -hmm. might be a little bit of work here and there to to you know make an adjustment on a texture or an adjustment on a file format for it to work in this one. But we find it doesn't require us going back and doing you know a bunch more work. Usually it's another extra hour or so to to bring that that experience at a different platform. Mm. And that's, I guess, sounds like one of the biggest advantages uh, of kind of working with you, right? With your companies. Um, the the fact that you guys know those nuances of the different metaverses, some of the kind of partnerships, obviously you're doing a lot of work with Spatial, you mentioned um, some others there, but um, being able to know the nuances and requirements and, and things like that. So that, that makes it really unique. And I think helpful for those that are trying to navigate, uh, hey, how do we get into this? And hey, I want to replicate, you know, do a digital clone of my office or, or you know, think of something new, um, you guys can kind of help navigate and, and do some things like that. Yeah, that's one of the first, that's one of the first things we do is we, we meet with our clients and sort of ask them, okay, what are your requirements? What are you looking for? And then based on that list, and we've studied 35 different platforms, there's actually hundreds, but we've started, we've studied 35 different ones, we've actively built on 10 of them. And then what we'll listen to them and say, okay, based on that, then these are the things, then these are your two or three options that make the most sense. And Generally, what I tell everyone is there's not a single platform that'll do every single thing you want. Mm. So usually you're going to have to sometimes, but usually you're going to have to say, I'm going to have to let go of one thing that I'd like or two things that I'd like to have. And then we can usually tell our clients, OK, listen, this is the, this is the platform will hit 80, 90 percent of the things that you're looking for. Mm. You're going to have to let go of this. And then we go back to these platforms and say, hey, guys, if you would add this feature and add this feature, you might, you know, you might be able to <laughs> capture more work. Um, but that's helpful, I think, and not just from the knowledge of like what limits there are, but also uh, when someone says, hey, do you have, we want to build this, we want to have a, a, a movie theater and a, a movie watching experience, or we want to do a, a, a large event with thousands of people, or we want to have an event that, mm. you know, we can, we, can, we can have interviews, live interviews, we can usually say, okay, you know, we know which platforms will do that, but we also know like, <laughs> sometimes based on their, their requirements, like this is going to cost this much, this is going to take this long, this is going to require this much energy and time. So, you know, give people more than just sort of which option makes the most sense, but re really right off the bat, sort of a concept in terms of, of time and cost as well. And we hear that that's, you, you know, usually pretty appreciated to be able to give uh, yeah. a, scope, a scope and cost really early on in the process. No, definitely. And I think, you know, having, having experienced, uh, I think, almost all the environments that you mentioned there and, and and a few others I don't think that you did mention probably on that list of 35 um, it's still kind of confusing on on what you know what's compatible what 
you know, to what extent can you do this? What's the poly count? You know, what kind of textures can you bring in? You know, can, will the, will the glass that I used in Blender be brought in or does it have to be a PNG? You know, it's like all these little nuances that kind of come with that. You talked about like running an event with a thousand people or running an event with maybe less. I can imagine I'm, I'm thinking of a few there that are, are limited in that, in that sense. Um, so there's, there's all these different environments, I guess, I guess, uh, and you said there isn't essentially one environment that does it all. I guess, what are some of the technological advancements that you think still need to happen for uh, for some of these platforms to, to take off or, or be more widely accepted? Well, I mean, because I've been working in virtual reality since 96, and, and by the way, I'm teaching a class next, next week, I start uh, teaching a class at UCLA Extension on XR world building. But oh, because wow. I, yeah, because I've been working in this space for 26 years, um, you know, our passion, my passion was always on the hardware, right? I'm going to MIT, the hackathon here in two and two hours, and I'm taking multiple VR, AR headsets and all that stuff to like work out all these things and get a chance to play with the new tools. Um, some of this is hardware related, right? Some of this is the hardware has to make advancements. And there were, you know, if you go back just to three or four years ago, you'd say, well, the hardware is not there yet. And it, and it really wasn't. And, and if you look at the sort of the inflection point on the hardware and what really changed things, it was the Oculus Quest 2. Oculus Quest 2 was the first kind of pretty, pretty well powered device that was totally, you know, standalone. You didn't need a computer inexpensive $300. I'm not trying to sell sell it, but I will say like, look, it was the number one gift at Christmas or number one digital technology this Christmas for a reason, because it is a, a lot of power for $300. And um, the other thing I've heard a ton of companies, you know, tell me in the last three months, like we just bought 500 VR headsets for our entire team. We just bought a thousand. We just bought 50. Our executives all now have Oculus Quest. So, um, it's, it's been a combination of hardware and software. And if you look forward of where it is, but I look back and go 26 years ago, I can see how the slow advancement of hardware and software has, has developed. And I will tell you that even just 15, 20 years ago, the software wasn't really the, the, the lagging problem. It was the hardware. The software was more advanced than the hardware was for most of the last uh, 20 something years. Wow. It's now more that the hardware is catching up and now the software can kind of run in conjunction with that. Now, not everyone who's doing the metaverse is saying it's got to be a VR or an AR device. So some of them will say it just has to be a web version. And that's fine, but that's not necessarily where our focus is on. So our team, my entire team, we've got 15 creators of with different skills and backgrounds in architecture and landscape architecture and interior design and, 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 and uh, product, product design and all that. But we, we come at it from the, the world of experiencing this in virtual reality. How do we have this experience in virtual reality? It's kind of transcendent. That's incredible. That makes you feel like you're connected and it, it goes beyond just the web experience. So what's going to come down the road in the next few years is better hardware. I'm going to, I'm excited to go see the magic leap to, uh, tomorrow at or, or the next day at MIT. Um, and then I know that we're going to see improvements on the Oculus Quest as well. I mean, there's there's already kind of like a, a rumor about what's coming out and the specifications. We're going to see some product, uh, some type of uh, VR, AR device from Apple. And I think everyone's really excited to see what that turns out to be. Um, and then, you know, the software is like what's possible from a platform perspective uh, is is really great at this current state. And if you look at all the different companies out there that are producing and have a, have a program or a software or application, whether it's existing on a on a, a an Oculus or for a HTC Vive or a Pico Neo or runs on a Hololens 2 or Unreal or whether it's an only web experience, the software is pretty advanced. I mean, clearly they've still got some room to go. But I think when you start to see these new advances in hardware. Things like facial tracking, things like uh, better advanced haptics, uh, uh, you know, just just more power, more more sophistication, uh, better better the better visual side on on what the optics look like in these in these uh, glasses. Um, we're 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 at that early stage. I tell people like if you think back to what the iPhone one was like. Um, it was an incredible device by by its current standards by the time it came out. The, the, the iPhone 1 was game-changing. But compared to an iPhone 13, the iPhone 1 seems like a 
brick. It's a paperweight. It was useless compared to what <laughs> you have now, you know, yeah. uh, 14, 15 years later. So we're going to see the same advancements, I think, in the, the, the realm of the VR and the AR equipment. We're going to see gradual and, and occasionally a bump up and improvement. But we're at that point where businesses now, I think, see and individuals see the advantages are there. It's time to get in. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, you have lots of insights there, given given the background in VR and things like that. Yeah, we're we're we've been kind of closely monitoring some of the patents coming, you know, the leaks and and patents coming from Apple and their kind of MR headset that that's like you 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 referenced. You talked about Oculus's, uh, I think it's Project Cambria that is rumored to come out this year or early next year. Um, kind of more of that pro prosumer or, or professional device um, that they have. Lots of interesting things there, like you said, with the eye tracking and even we've heard rumors of the mouth tracking and additional cameras on board and, and uh, you know, that'll end up enabling lots of new uh, possibilities. Uh, and then uh, you talked about it over Christmas, you know, being one of the biggest, uh, I think it was the largest, you know, the, the most popular gift, uh, uh, most searched, you know, gift as well. Um, I don't know if any reports have come out on how many were sold there, but I think we probably went from the 30 million, uh, you know, standalone VR headsets from for Oculus probably to to uh, who knows double. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I guess here soon at the end of their Q1 reports here. But yeah, lots of interesting uh, advancements there. So you you talked about VR being uh, being where your focus is in your company and your 15 kind of employees. Um, so as you think about the future, I guess maybe let's take a step take a take a step back and maybe look at a bird's eye view of of the metaverse. I would love to get your definition of uh, of what the metaverse is um, and then maybe kind of build off of that just a little bit if we can. Yeah. I mean, we get this question uh, every, every time I go into a panel or anything, and I think it's uh, it's a good question and it's important to sort of get uh, an alignment of where, you know, if, if someone is talking to you, what their interpretation of the metaverse is, because it's a word that's being used a lot. It's get thrown around a lot. And, you know, I, I'll just say here's how here's how I here's how I interpret it. Uh, we don't have the metaverse yet. We're not even really close to a metaverse yet. We're we're really pretty far away from a metaverse. You could say we have many verses. You could say we have multiverses. Those are fair. If you take the narrow look at it, we're far away from a metaverse. If you take the wide view, right, which is being used by some people out there, then we already have had a metaverse for quite some time. The, the, the internet is in essence a metaverse or anything three-dimensional on the web is, is a metaverse. Um, I, you know, again, I think you could ask, you could get 20 different people in here and ask them the question, you'll get 20 different answers. But I don't think we really truly have the metaverse. I don't think that uh, it's wrong to use the word metaverse because we're talking about something that we're headed towards. And so when I look about what my definition of metaverse is or what I'm looking for, I love the book Ready Player One. I, I it was the, one of the first books I, I really couldn't put down until I read the whole thing all the way through. Um, and and uh, the movie that Steven Spielberg did was phenomenal. He did a great job. And I think that what my company and what my team and what we're focused on is, is trying to aim our ship towards where we're going to intercept that world, where we're going to find in three to six years or two to four years a time when our quality and the what we're producing looks very much like what we saw in the in the Steven Spielberg Ready Player One movie without hopefully the giant corporation that's you know enslaving people but the positive side the fun side the exciting parts the fun the fun things you can do and we're talking with all kinds of brands and all kinds of celebrities and all kinds of, of musicians and we're talking about doing some amazing projects and so I can see that it is possible and we are headed that 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 direction but you have to take it with an understanding that this is the current state of the technology right now. The hardware only allows you to do this much. The internet only allows you to do this much. You know, there's some things we can't, we can't have everything we're dreaming of just yet, but we can aim towards where we think the metaverse is going to be. And that's what my company Polycount and M2 are really focused on is where it's going to be and trying to take a track to sort of intercept it at that point because we know that we'll have to improve and improve and improve to get it to look like what the Spielberg version of Ready Player Me looked like. Uh, and it's not achievable yet, but if we continue to try to strive for that, um, even if we don't get it quite right, but we get pretty close, I'm, I feel good about um, our direction. Got it. 
Wow, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And I, I tend to agree with you. I, I think, uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, we can call it a metaverse now. We can call it verses, right? But what, what we're really talking about when we when we say the metaverse is, is that ready player one, kind of fully immersive, you know, this is where we're jumping in. There are, you know, a lot of jobs happening. You know, education will be happening there. You know, it'll be, uh, you know, probably uh, more ergonomic and, and uh, you know, headsets and haptic feedback and all that kind of stuff that you see, uh, like you said, in the book and the movie. I hear there's another movie coming out here soon. I think that'll be cool to to, to see. But uh, so it sounds like those are some of the 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 key elements of kind of what we're what we're waiting for. So it's awesome that you guys are essentially pioneers to kind of help us build towards this vision of the the future of the metaverse. That's really really exciting um, uh, to see kind of how, you know where you where you're all playing in that in that space. Um, what uh do you think that there's a specific pl- platform that exists today or platforms that exist today that you you're excited about you think that will will make those leaps and bounds and and help us get there uh we know you know meta's changed their name from facebook to meta we're seeing epic games talk about their their role in the metaverse with roblox and fortnite and potentially opening that up and you know there's lots of companies almost it seems like weekly if not daily talking about uh, how the metaverse is coming and how they want to play a, a role in that but would love to get your take on that yeah, um, you know, I was I, I did I got hired to do a study on uh, these platforms back last year. A, a group wanted me to do a research project, and I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I'm dying to do a research project on this. And it was helpful just just to see the breadth of the different types of um, platforms out there and all the different ways in which they're you know metaverse is being interpreted and and people are trying to you know take their course towards it. And I see a lot of similarity. I see a lot of groups that are doing very similar approaches and, and you can say, well, if they're following each other, there's probably a reason they're seeing some, some things that, that they should be, you know, copying each other. Um, and I do believe that what we'll find over the next few years, the next four or five years is some consolidation. There's probably too many platforms right now. And so I think we'll probably see some consolidation with platforms that offer similar services and one has some more strengths or more cash or whatever, uh, more users and, you know, merges with another one. I do, th- I do think we'll see that. And I also think that if you look down the road, you'll probably see some some online metaverse group type ev- environments that are going to be focused on a, a, a niche sector like sporting goods or sports or, you know, uh, film or, you know, towards the arts or towards uh, education. So I do think that there's room for various groups to have the, the, like the, the, the tower of the best platform that supports, uh, you know, online online gambling, for example, or, or uh, you know, education or, uh, y- you know, tourism, for example, we're working with a few groups that are doing tourism. And as time goes by, I think certain platforms will just sort of, you know, gravitate towards where their strengths are. And we'll see that. I also think that the big companies, you know, the Microsoft with Altspace and, and, and Meta with, with Horizons obviously have so much cash and can sort of play a different approach where they can sort of sit back a little bit and experiment with different ideas and see what works. Apple might do something like this. And I think that, and I think I saw recently, what was it? Qualcomm is doing something. Qualcomm just put $100 million in towards building something. So I think we'll see hardware, we'll see service, we'll see, uh, you know, these these um, social social media companies that will have a, uh, a different different angle on this stuff. But I think as time goes by, we'll see consolidation and we'll see some winners and we'll see some losers. And I don't know who's going to be the winner just yet. I like Spatial. They're really smart guys. A lot of them came from Google. I've been working closely with them. We've we've really tried to help them, you know, evolve their platform. And they've been really helpful for me to sort of like bring us uh, opportunities to work with brands and, and groups and individuals that, you know, have these really interesting and clever ideas about what we can use their platform with. And I think that that they've got a strong position um, down the road. And I think that they're headed in the right. I think I, I talk to their CEO from time to time and I say, listen, our company's goals, my company and his company's goals are similar. Like, let's try to be the very best we can be. Let's try to let's try to do the best work that we possibly can get. And let's try to raise the level of the quality of the experience, raise the level of quality of the entire, you know, the entire space. And, um, you know, they may not be the, the ultimate metaverse, but 
it's not impossible for me to conceive that they could be. Um, I talk to people who are builders on different platforms and I don't want to say anything negative about any platform, but there are some out there that, you know, creators struggle with. They struggle with how do I get an experience to be impressive on this platform? If, if you're going to hold my limits down this low, or if you're not going to let me bring in these tools or you're not going to let me do these kinds of things. And so I, I would say that there's going to be some platforms that I think right now are making some missteps. And as time goes by, we'll see, but I think that they'll, they'll either struggle to be relevant or they're going to have to make some changes down the road to, to keep up with where this is headed. Because if, if at the end of the day, what we keep hearing from people who love our stuff is that, my gosh, I didn't realize an environment could look this good. I didn't realize the experience could feel this, this, this real or this natural. And I think that's what we're shooting for. We're striving to make people go, man, I didn't realize this was possible. And, and if I go to some platforms, that's not even, you can't get there because they've set the limits too low or they've, they've set some parameters where you can't achieve those things. So I think there's going to be clearly winners and losers. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, uh, I, I, have you heard of agile methodology, like a project management methodology of kind of releasing in increments? So essentially in project management, there's a, there's a few different styles that you can take on a project. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to come back to, to loop back around to what you just mentioned here. But uh, with the agile methodology, the concept is like when you're building a product, uh, let's say we're building a car, Agile methodology is uh, that you release with something a lot smaller. So you might start with rollerblades and then that's your initial release. And then you go from rollerblades to a skateboard, to a scooter, to a moped, to a motorcycle, right? To a tricycle, to, you know, a, a whatever the three, three, three wheeled <laughs> um, uh, motorized vehicles. And then you get to the car, but there's these incremental essentially releases to ultimately get to your, your product. Uh, alternatively, you have something called waterfall, which is kind of like, you kind of have a big reveal at the end of like, here's our car, right? My hope is that some of these platforms that do have limitations are kind of going in that process of like, hey, we're just kind of adopting the style, the blocky style, because we know that's a trend with Minecraft and with uh, Roblox and things like that. But hopefully we're starting to see that there's shifts, you know, depending on the, the different types of limitations that they have, that they start to kind of evolve and, and, uh, shift as we get to kind of that more immersive and hyper realistic kind of environments that we're kind of hoping for. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've seen sure. some platforms start to do that and others that have not. And I think it'll be interesting because yeah, I think in the end we'll, we'll have some winners and losers for, sh for sure. Yeah. Um, I've been interested recently, uh, I, I, uh, been interested in Somnium space. Have you played with them before? I have, I've got some friends who work there. Yeah. It's a, it's oh, a neat great. platform. Yeah. Yeah, that, there's been a lot of interesting things there. They, they seem to be a, I don't know if it's a sleeping giant, but I, I would call them a sleeping giant because it's there isn't a lot of hype and talk about what they're doing there, but uh, still not quite as accessible as something like uh, Spatial, for example, right? That you can go on a mobile phone, get native apps, you can go in the browser, you can go into VR across different headsets, you can go into HoloLens if you want. Um, so Somnia Space isn't quite there. They still require a pretty high-end PC. They recently released a the Quest, the standalone Quest version, and they're about a month ago, and they've been doing you know incremental updates on a weekly basis of kind of allowing a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, but that that's been a platform I think we've been watching to see you know as soon as that becomes more and more accessible, that'll be uh, that'll be interesting to see if they become a, a bigger player. Similar with Meta, right? Like Meta, we really we've consumed Horizon Worlds and Horizon uh, venues, Horizon workrooms. And we're impressed. Obviously, it's more of a, st a cartoony style, upper body, similar to spatial, right? Um, but as far as the kind of interactivity and some of the UX of breaking out into different rooms, that's been really exciting to see some of the things that they're building there. Um, and, and obviously, there's a lot of a lot of money uh, behind the scenes there to kind of continue to improve that. Um, but our, our biggest concern there was like, again, uh, you have to have a VR headset to consume it versus something like spatial. And so uh, there's been rumors of that coming to, to Instagram and Facebook and, and how that might just be a tab away where you can kind of go into a virtual environment. So anyway, we're, I think the, the, the um, cross device uh, cross compatibility will be a big, a big thing that will help some of these platforms kind of reach, reach more people, maybe reach the masses. And then, then obviously um, 
you know, kind of uh, getting into that more hyper realism, I think gets us closer to that vision that you talked about of Ready Player One and, and some of Steven Spielberg's kind of take on on what we saw in the movie. Yeah, uh, so it'll, be, it'll be cool to kind of see how that evolves. I think I think this year and, and probably next year will be big. We'll, we'll probably see some big, big waves. Um, uh, as we, you talked about this as well, but some big waves with other players releasing their first you know, mixed reality headset or maybe the, another version or consumer version, we might see more, uh, you know, AR or smart glasses. I think we already have a few companies playing in that space and that that'll start to have more competition and evolve all that kind of competition is, is going to be good. Like you said, with the iPhone one to the iPhone 13, you start to get, uh, yeah, you'll get some incremental updates here and there, but you'll, st- we'll start to see some more competition. And, uh, and I think that'll help with, uh, kind of quickly, quickly, you know, advancing the, the hardware even, even further. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, so, uh, what would you say to, to those businesses? Uh, So, so recently I was at South by Southwest and one of the biggest terminology, one of the biggest terms, I mean, obviously NFTs was brought up a ton and I, and I had to help define things for some people that hadn't really experienced much with NFTs, but also the metaverse was, quite prominent as a as a topic on in one of the kind of exhibition halls um and that's that was kind of interesting and, and yet i still heard a lot of professionals and and uh you know business owners kind of kind of laugh or kind of like roll their eyes of like yeah that that's that's not coming or that's like so far into the future what would you say to businesses or professionals that may or may not be yeah that may not be taking the metaverse seriously right now um you know, I don't know that I would say the metaverse has to be in every single business's plans. Uh, I think that you could make an argument that there's going to be certain certain businesses that don't need to worry about the metaverse. Um, you know, uh, uh, an undertaker. You know, uh, uh, you know, a funeral home probably doesn't need a metaverse <laughs> yeah. right now. But yeah. um, but I would say this: Look, McDonald's. We did two projects with McDonald's, and they after the second one, they trademarked metaverse restaurant like 14 different trademarks we worked with um, a bunch of different brands and they're taking it very seriously and if you're looking at companies like ford and cvs and walmart and you know clearly the big brands like the big uh the big technology companies i mean obviously you know you've got microsoft and and google and and facebook and and uh you know apple taking it very very seriously but now you've got you know you've got all kinds of big corporations throwing uh, a lot of energy, time, money, and manpower into figuring out where to where they're going to invest, how they're going to invest, and what they're going to do. Um, I think the argument is it's coming whether you want to be involved or not. And if you don't want to be involved, I would just say look back to, you know, 1997, 98, and you say, we don't need a website. You needed a website. You had to have a website. You, you realized in 2000 or 2001 that you needed a website. Maybe the dot-com bubble happened and you – you were or you were not involved, but you definitely needed a website and you're going to need a metaverse. You're going to need a metaverse um, uh, place, just like you needed a web a web address. You're going to need a metaverse address. You're going to need a, a virtual reality uh, or a, a three-dimensional um, website that uh, people can interact with. And, and I will say that uh, I had a company reach out to me, oh gosh, it was 2017. And they were like, can you advise us on this other stuff? And, you know, we're interested in your take on all this. And I told them like, it, this was 2017. I go in about three or four years, you're going to want to have a virtual reality uh, office space where people can uh, come and have meetings with you, where you can go and, and, and uh, interact with your clients and your employees who are remote. And they were kind of like, that's crazy. No way, no way. And, you know, here it is five years later. And, tons of businesses are creating these types of environments and i will say there's there's sort of like two approaches we see there's the inward approach which we're talking with some groups right now some very very large corporations that are saying we want to build a metaverse experience for our employees to communicate to each other to have meetings we want to have a experience metaverse experience for our for our teams to train our new employees or just to have a a fun place to get to hang out with the other other people who are not who are not coming into the office. So there's the inward approach, but then there's the outward approach. Like we're working with uh, uh, Jose Corvo and uh, with McDonald's and a few other brands like that. And, and they're interested in how do we engage with our customers and our fans and people who are, uh, you know, we want to, you know, increase and broaden the scope of our, of our um, customers uh, and bring something new to the table. And so there's that 
inside outside approach where they're looking at the metaverse from their own internal purposes and then how do we reach out to the to the to the community at large outside and um clearly i i see brands doing it both ways so it's not to me it's not the right idea to say ah metaverse metaverse we're not going to play with that uh it seems like everyone should at the very least start to think through how they want to be perceived in the in this technology in the next you know two to five years because it's definitely coming for sure wow wow i love that yeah we recently interviewed um uh, Bruno Larvol from Yeah, Larvol. he's a good, think, he, he's a friend of mine. Yeah, he's a yeah, great he guy. mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> he mentioned that, yeah, he'd worked with you guys. I think you guys had helped him out uh, on, on, on a few things there. And uh, yeah, he told me that they're at 220 plus days of running their business in the metaverse. And he told us about some of the, uh, some of the problems he's faced, but also some of the new things that he's kind of learned. And uh, this, this level, this, this concept of like, even from a virtual standpoint, having connectivity and being able to almost, you know, physically be close to each other, the proximity actually plays a factor into kind of our, our empathy towards each other and, and, and just like being able to collaborate more immersively versus something like Zoom or a phone call or something like that. And they're finding that there's some, there's some, some really key learnings there for their company um, that have been really, really beneficial. Um, it'll, it'll be interesting to hear his take on it um, after spending the whole year in the metaverse. Yeah. I can say that, you know, my entire team, except for one person, uh, works from home. So if I were to look, show you over side of this screen here, <laughs> there's, all, there's like 15 computers with uh, dual screens, a powerful workstation, yep. and nobody's sitting there. They're remoting in from home. But when we want to have a meeting with someone, what we generally do is we say, hey, uh, let's spin up a space or let's go into one of these environments, which we have hundreds right now, mm. and let's go talk through uh, what this is going to be. So uh, you, can, you can sketch in real time together. You walk around each other. You can bring in models and photographs, and you can, you can do all kinds of things. And you feel like you're in the physical presence of those people but just the people that you want to meet with for just that period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be a five minute meeting and more, more productive and more successful than a 15 or a 40 minute phone call, because you're able to sort of have that sense of co-location and sketch in 3d and look at photographs together and point to things yep. and pull up websites and stuff like that. And all, all the whole time, you know, I'm here at my office and they're in there, their bedroom or their living room at, you know, any someplace else in the, in the city. And uh, they could come into the office, but they choose not to. And we found that it's actually probably more successful to have it, have it work this way than have them here in the office. Wow. Wow. And do you think the, the whole, the whole pandemic kind of helped accelerate that a little bit? A hundred percent. No question. I mean, for the first six months of the pandemic, we really were not, I was the one who was pushing the virtual reality. My team really wasn't on board yet. We were still finishing up sort of like some architectural work. And when I started to bring people into virtual reality in October, uh, that's when we started to really kind of start to refine our process. But we found that this was a new way to work and it was really neat. We also realized initially we needed a lot of space because back in 2020, if you were going to build an environment on spatial, you needed a big physical space to work with. Because if you wanted to move a wall over here, you had to walk across the, the wall. So we have a space about the size of a basketball court, a big open uh, floor plan. Wow. Um, since then, they've changed that platform and that's not necessary. But uh, no question, the pandemic dramatically has increased uh, the the ability to do this way. But also, I think the businesses out there, um, their interest has gone up considerably because I think a lot of them realize not all the employees are going to come back and how and the Zoom call works for certain things. But the Zoom call is not that great when you've got 25 people on a call and you need three of them to go have a conversation over here about this and five of them to go have a conversation about this and three of them to go talk about that and then come back for a few minutes for another follow, you know, for a little, you know, group session and then go back and do your other things. Well, you can do that in virtual reality super easy, but you can't mm -hmm. do that on a Zoom call so easy. Yeah. Yeah. We found that recently kind of ran a, a meeting. I think we used spatial and we had some joining in the browser, some joining on a mobile phone, some in VR and just like you said, the pointing and, and being able to pull up photos quickly and drag them into a, a to, to a space, take sticky notes, like all those kinds of things um, definitely increase the, the productivity, I think, uh, from some of that. And um, yeah, it's been good to see platforms like Zoom and, and others kind of take off. Microsoft Teams, I think, is another big one that kind of took off and uh, to kind of help enable kind of dispersed 
uh, teams and things like that and, and allow for more collaboration. Um, and some have like, like, uh, Larvel's, uh, Bruno Larvel's company, right. Uh, they've just taken to the metaverse as a, as a, you know, I think they're using horizon workrooms, uh, for any time they're doing screen sharing and then kind of holding meetings and, and doing fun things over in spatial. Um, and so we're seeing some, some companies do that. You mentioned in t- what potentially two to, two to five or three to six, I was going to ask you what, where, where do you think, uh, you know, what do you think we'll be talking about for, for the metaverse in, in three to five years? It sounds like you think it might be here by then, right? Like we might have a more immersive, hyper-realistic uh, environment, mass adopted, that kind of thing. Do you think that's coming in that in that period of time or what else are yeah. you predicting will happen then? I think it's going to be gradual, right? Like I was advised this uh, 16, 17 years ago when I was super excited about virtual reality and a guy from uh, by the name of Andy Beal from World Biz in Santa Barbara is like, Michael, virtual reality happens the advancements happen really slowly. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but it started in the 60s with the Navy. So it's it's taken a long time. We're now 60 plus years from when the virtual reality was first kind of introduced. But yeah. I think it'll be a gradual. And at the same time, there's a lot more money and a lot more interest, a lot more eyeballs, a lot more potential and opportunity with it now. So it is going to, you know, I think probably accelerate at a relatively, uh, you know, exponential rate. But still, we're not, we're, we've only got, maybe what, uh, 0.1% of the population of, of the planet, um, you know, who owns a VR headset, who's working in, in immersive technology. So we're a long ways away before it reaches the point where, uh, you know, you're going to count on the fact that you can reach out to a friend or whatever and experience an immersive experience with them. Like it's going to take a while before it's it's consistently, uh, you know, you know, people are going to do it. I do think that it will eventually will replace uh, the phone. And I think that you know, three to five years is the right time frame, and maybe it's closer to five, but where you won't be carrying around a phone. You're not going to carry around an iPhone mm. 20. You're going to carry around a pair of glasses and probably a little tiny, you know, computer that has, I'm going to show you this one. This is from Nreal, uh, a little tiny computer that has the battery and the processor in here, mm. but you're going to carry around the glasses right here that are going to bring up all your information. You'll either yep. put them on all the time, they'll be thinner and lighter than this, and you'll wear them all the time and you'll only turn it on when you need them, or it'll constantly be reading the information around you and whenever it's important or necessary, it'll give you contextual information on the world you're in. Um, I think that's coming. Uh, the next three to five years sounds right. I mean, three years is probably the point where most big brands have a posi- have a place in the metaverse. Uh, three to five years is probably when we'll see a number of companies, um, you know, merge or find themselves in a strong position. I, d- I don't think I, it may never happen. We may, we may never have a completely, totally um, interoperable metaverse where you can literally go from any place on the metaverse to any place. And that may not happen but just because a company like Meta or a company like Apple or a company like Microsoft or a company like, I don't know, NVIDIA or one of these groups has a strong position and it's not in their advantage to share and let other people go into that connection, you know, go to that connection. They may not want people to just jump into their platform. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I can't say for sure, but I think that we'll be working towards that place where there's consolidation. And as time, as time goes by, the smaller teams, I think the smaller groups will say, let's become interoperable. Let's have portals that go from place that, you know, connect our, from our platform to your platform to that platform. And, and maybe there'll be a day down the road at some point where you can literally go anywhere in the metaverse from any place in the metaverse. But I do think that's a ways off. Wow. Wow. I love, love that prediction. I don't think I'll add anything to that. That'll be exciting. Uh, an exciting future. Three to five years is not that far away. Um, so yeah, that'll be exciting. Uh, I, I do welcome, welcome that future. I do think that it's going to enable us to, uh, not be more disconnected, but actually be more connected to each other and being able to, you know, I think there's fears around that, but, uh, I think that it will bring us, uh, to be more connected than, than we think. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you for the time today. What, what's the best way for those consuming this interview to kind of connect with you or your company and see some of the work that you're doing? Well, I mean, I, I, I get a lot of emails. That's probably the best way you can find me. Um, best way is probably m2studio.net or m2studio.com. There's a connect button there or polycount.io. Both of those will send uh, contact form to me or you could email me directly. It's mpots at m2studio.net. Um, and yeah, we love to hear people have got 
you know, interesting projects they're interested in, or just want to ask some questions about, you know, what's the best platform for me. Uh, we're trying to be as, as share as much as we can to, to give them um, useful information because we want to see this platform. We want to see this, this entire space grow. We want to see the metaverse become a reality. We want to see this immersive experience be something that we can share with larger numbers of people and it grow and grow and grow. So I'm happy to help, you know, move things along. Great. Well, thank you so much for the time today. We appreciate all that you're doing uh, for the metaverse and helping accelerate that. And I'm uh, excited to see how you and your company will play a role towards that kind of future to Ready Player One and, and allow us to kind of connect with uh, people in a more immersive way. Um, appreciate your insights and, and kind of uh, predictions as well. Uh, my pleasure, Johnny. It was good talking to you today.